Well, I, I'm from Israel. I, I, you don't have to start promptly for me. Uh, I, uh, uh, I have to apologize for my uh, appearance. I, I had just arrived a half an hour ago or so. I, I, had, uh, I had brought my best suit to, to try to make a good impression this first time, but uh, I'll have to wait till next time. Um, anyway, uh, um, uh, it's a pleasure to be back at, at Limud. The four talks that I'm scheduled to give here, uh, all of them in the afternoon, uh, are actually on subjects uh, that I've treated in a book of mine that was scheduled to come out simultaneously with this session. I'm not sure, I didn't have a chance to check on the internet. Um, but the book is called uh, The Kingly Sanctuary, and uh, it's really not a sales pitch. Uh, you, can, you can get it from Amazon.com, <laughs> either as an e-book for your Kindle or as a real book if you're a Shomer Shabbat and that's when you read. Uh, I, <laughs> I have to tell you, I'm not going to make a lot of money off this book. In fact, I'm not going to make a red cent, uh, but uh, uh, because I'm sort of publishing it through Amazon. But uh, I hope if you're interested in what you hear this week, you won't stop there because the book covers uh, a lot more than well, what I can say in these four talks. So with that introduction, I thought I'd speak this afternoon about a much dis discussed topic that figures in that book, uh, namely modern biblical scholarship and traditional Jewish belief. Uh, perhaps I should start by telling you something about what modern biblical scholars have discovered about the Bible. Tell me if you can't hear me, by the way, it's okay? A little, a little, I, I think this thing has actually a volume control on it, but uh, I'm afraid I might end up turning it off. Uh, let's see, well. No. All right, I'll just talk louder. Uh, maybe if I move this a little closer. Oh, um, uh, so I wanted to start off by saying something about modern biblical scholarship and what these scholars know, but I always hesitate to do this because uh, some of you know this, and then there are others who never heard anything about it, and it sort of falls on you like a ton of bricks. So. Uh, I always um, start off with my own uh, uh, PG-13 sort of warning uh, that <laughs> my talk contains some scenes that might not be appropriate for all audiences. Um, Jews, when they hear about modern biblical scholarship, Jews are mainly concerned about the documentary hypothesis, the idea uh, that goes back to the 19th century that our Torah is really the product of four or five different sources uh, from different periods in Israel's history uh, that have sometimes been artfully and sometimes less than artfully uh, woven together to form our present text. And certainly that idea is disturbing for traditional Jews. Uh, the Torah itself implies, and certainly later tradition asserts outright, that the entire Torah was given by God to Moses at Mount Sinai. Maimonides made it one of his 13 principles that every Jew ought to subscribe to. So the documentary hypothesis has been a problem for Jews uh, since it was first propounded toward the end of the 19th century. Uh, but that's only one of the troubling issues raised by modern scholars. There's the whole matter of the historicity or historical accuracy of biblical narrative. The, for example, uh, the Torah's narrative of the exodus from Egypt, the subsequent uh, conquest of Canaan, the rise of David's empire, and how David came to be king. All these narratives have been seriously questioned by uh, modern scholars. Did things really happen that way? That's what people want to know. Well, archaeologists and Egyptologists have looked in vain for evidence of a massive presence of Israelites in Egypt at the time preceding the Exodus. Uh, there indeed were Northwestern Semites, that's us, uh, in Egypt at various times, but not apparently near the time of the Exodus. Uh, another difficulty is the biblical assertion that 600,000 adult male Israelites, along with their wives, children, and livestock, uh, 
survived in the desert for 40 years. We can't know exactly where they were most of the time, nor do we have a geologically accurate picture of the water or food resources available, but certainly the traditional account has raised questions for scholars about its uh, historical accuracy. Nor is there any archeological evidence of any massive Israelite invasion of Canaan as recounted in the book of Joshua. Uh, Jericho was an unwalled town, perhaps even uninhabited at the time when Joshua is said to have entered the land of Canaan and made the walls of Jericho fall down. Uh, what's more, most of the detailed account of that conquest focuses on a surprisingly small part of Canaan, a few square kilometers really. And even that doesn't really match the archeological record. Then quite apart, should I go on? Uh, <laughs> quite apart from these sorts of questions is the whole matter of the unity of various books of the Bible um, and the authors to whom tradition attributes them. Scarcely a book in the Bible, uh, the Tanakh, uh, that um, exists that modern scholars have not declared to be the result of multiple authors from different periods. Uh, just for example, the book of Isaiah, uh, a, a scholars have recognized really since the time of the great Jewish biblical scholar Abraham Ibn Ezra uh, in the Middle Ages. Uh, uh, scholars have recognized that chapters 40 through 66, that's a lot, 27 chapters, uh, couldn't really have come from the original Isaiah. Rather, these chapters seem to, preser uh, to um, um, pre presume a sixth century setting. They mention, without any introduction, the Persian emperor of the time, Cyrus, and further uh, refer to the Babylonian exile, which only took place in the sixth century. Um, and if that weren't bad enough, even those first 39 chapters are now thought by scholars to come from different hands in different periods. Um, similarly, the book of Psalms. Did David really write these Psalms? David lived in the 10th century, but there are uh, at least a couple of Psalms that refer to the Babylonian exile again, 400 years later. The same is true of Solomon's authorship of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, uh, and the Song of Songs. Indeed, there's hardly any book for which modern scholars are willing to accept completely either its traditional attribution or its authorial unity. Uh, well, I, I think I will stop there. Yeah, this just gets too depressing. Um, <laughs> this is a page later. This is hardly a complete catalog, but the question I've asked myself over the last three or four decades is what is a religious Jew to make of all this? I know basically four approaches to this question. Number one, some Jews just dismiss the archeological and other evidence I've mentioned as unproven hypotheses. And I have to I understand that, but it's hard to maintain such a stance if you actually follow this research in detail. Some of it at least looks pretty convincing. Uh, modern biblical scholars, I should add, uh, since I'm speaking of some of my former colleagues, are for the most part not, for the most part, not wicked debunkers. They're not out to get the Bible. They're, in fact, a lot of them are, um, you know, themselves uh, ministers, Protestant ministers, or perhaps more revealingly, the sons and daughters of Protestant ministers. <laughs> but, um, so it's difficult ju just to dismiss uh, modern biblical scholarship with a wave of the hand. The second approach is, is to ignore the problematic elements and uh, uh, adopt the things that aren't problematic and assert that basically modern biblical scholarship is okay. Um, I, I really can't see this. Uh, you know, I know some people say, well, you know, it's okay to accept the lower criticism, little insights into this word or that word, um, but uh, higher criticism, these larger claims about whole books um, are, are to be avoided. I, I don't know where uh, you could draw a dividing line. It's really a, a whole approach. Uh, so how can you start down the road of modern biblical scholarship and then suddenly say, wait a minute, I don't like that conclusion. Another common stance is it may be right, but I don't want to know about it. Uh, actually, I can see that position. 
if you consider Islam, um, a Quranic scholarship for at least a century has followed a similar path. The same sorts of questions are asked, the same sorts of problems arise from a uh, sustained inquiry uh, into uh, the composition of the uh, Quran. When was, uh, which surah was written before which and what influences stand behind it. And it turns out, uh, this is no surprise in the 21st century, that Islam seems to have borrowed a lot from Judaism, not just monotheism and not just uh, the Bible, the Tanakh, but a lot of Midrash, the all too human Jewish traditions of biblical interpretation. Some scholars, including me, have researched this topic and have found that lots of things in the Quran really come from rabbinic interpretations of the Torah. But what effect has this uh, research had on mainstream Islam? that has been going on, as I said, for more than a century, almost none. Apparently, uh, most Muslims just don't care. Don't bother me with that stuff. I remember once I gave a talk at, uh, at Ohio State uh, about a, um, uh, you know, it was actually about uh, some elements in part of the Quran in, in Surah Yusuf uh, that uh, clearly seemed to be borrowed from uh, rabbinic interpreters and um, this was around the time when a fatwa had been issued for Salman Rushdie. And uh, I was very nervous because there were a, a fair number of, of, you know, they have a very good Islamic studies department, including lots of, uh, um, you know, faithful Muslims. But uh, no, they said, you know, that, we, <laughs> that was an interesting talk. It doesn't make any difference. Um, for that matter, if you look at Christianity, today's evangelical Christians just basically shrug off modern biblical scholarship. For many of them, um, the Bible is literally true, and the infallibility of Scripture is part of their profession of faith. So why shouldn't a Jew be like them and simply say, it must be wrong because it contradicts my faith, or simply, I don't want to know about it. Um, I really have nothing against other Jews taking such a position, um, but for myself, I've never liked the idea that there exists this great body of research out there touching on some of the things that are truly vital to me uh, and my life, but nevertheless, I just le want to leave it over there and not find out uh, what it's all about. Uh, I'm not saying that this should be the attitude of everyone. Uh, but uh, this is um, my attitude. These are the things that bothered me when I was in college, and that's how I got into this field. But I must add that I don't think it's easy for a lot of people, uh, uh, perhaps sitting here, people who otherwise inhabit uh, the modern world. I mean, I don't, I don't think that it's easy to sh simply shrug this stuff off, uh, because most of you, I suspect, inhabit the modern world. Many of you have are studying or have studied in universities uh, with all the modern way of investigating things. And it's hard for people in such a position to maintain that I just don't want to know is a, is a reasonable stance. Actually, I believe that everyone, not just students and professors, ultimately want, wants to know the truth as best we can know it. This may sound naive, but truthfully, I don't say this as an article of a faith, it's just something I've observed over the years. It's true, of course, that people often try to make the minimum adjustment possible in order to accommodate some new truth. Uh, that happens all the time in the history of ideas. And people often accompany the new truth with some apologetic spin. That's actually very common. But just to ignore new evidence is pretty hard to do over the long haul. Um, so um, what is a religious Jew to make of all this modern biblical scholarship? Actually, I don't think this is a particularly hard question if you just think about it for a while, 40 years in my case. Um, but I'm afraid, given the limited amount of time, my answer this afternoon will have to be somewhat schematic. In general, I'd say that modern biblical scholarship is not simply the truth about the Bible, but a certain kind of truth about a certain conception of the Bible. And that's really the idea that I want to flesh out this afternoon.
Uh, modern biblical scholarship uh, began as a product of the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century. Uh, this was at the end of the period known as the Renaissance, first in Italy and later France and Germany and England, and uh, th this was a time of great intellectual openness. It really started in Italy with the rediscovery of the uh, uh, you know, classical Greek and Latin texts that had been uh, their heritage, but they you know, really uh, hadn't had access to them for various reasons until the 16th century. So people learned uh, you know, Greek. Uh, the only place really in Europe in the Middle Ages where you could learn Greek was in southern Italy, but now it's spread abroad. Um, and, uh, and then they began learning Hebrew uh, in some ways thanks to the invention of the uh, printing press. Um, people, you could get a little primer teaching you how um, you know, gr Hebrew grammar works and giving you a basic uh, vocabulary, and then, uh, then you could be uh, on your own. Um, the, um, um, this immediately led to people retranslating the Bible into the Latin. Uh, the, uh, our, the, the Latin Bible that had been around until then was uh, the master work of uh, Jerome, who was an extraordinary scholar uh, and, uh, and had translated directly from the Hebrew. Uh, but he was really the last significant Christian to know Hebrew for quite a while. Um, but now, uh, with the availability of these Hebrew grammars and so forth, people began to retranslate the Bible into Latin, and uh, they said, after some hesitation, you know, this isn't, Jerome's translation isn't right. Uh, it doesn't agree with the words of the text. So soon they were translating the whole Bible on their own, and then uh, not long after that, translating it into the vernacular languages. Well, the roots of this whole movement are in the Renaissance, but it soon intersected um, or they soon intersected with the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century. The reformers' goal was to overthrow the power of the Pope and the Church in Rome. The Church had a number of weak points you could attack. You know, they owned all this real estate and that, you know, didn't seem moral in the face of uh, poverty. They uh, you, you used to uh, uh, get uh, f your sins forgiven through the purchase of an indulgence, and uh, um, that would probably bother most people. <laughs> uh, they had another system called, another phenomenon of the church was called simony, where if you came from a, you know, uh, the right family, the few, the rich, and the well-born, you could purchase high office in the church. Um, but also, another weak point, uh, that was attacked by the reformers was uh, the traditional Christian interpretation of the Bible. Uh, the Roman uh, Catholic approach uh, to interpreting the Bible was actually similar in some ways to traditional Jewish interpretation, to Midrash. Um, written, uh, the written text does not always tell you the whole story. Traditions accompanied the text from earliest times. But the Catholic Church had developed their own traditions in such a way as to strain credibility. Uh, it was common towards the end of the Middle Ages to speak of the four senses of Scripture. Uh, that is to say, each verse in all of Scripture, each verse was potentially capable of being understood in four different ways. Um, especially popular were, uh, was the interpretation of the Old Testament as a foreshadowing of the New Testament, as every Christian knew uh, in the Middle Ages, quod in vetere latet in novo patet. Uh, what uh, uh, lies hidden in the Old Testament is openly revealed in the New Testament. So there are all these stories really are just, even though they, they're about people named, you know, Moses and Joshua and Jacob, they're really all about uh, Jesus. So for the new uh, Protestants, these traditions just didn't make sense. They were, that wasn't what the Hebrew words were saying. So why should we accept them, they said. There's a guy named Abraham, and he had a son named Isaac, who he was ordered to kill. Why is this a foreshadowing of the crucifixion? Um, and of course, proving that the Catholic Church's way of interpreting the Bible was wrong, that it didn't fit the words, was a great way of undermining the church's authority, which is exactly what the Protestants wanted to do. 
So the new Protestant churches championed the literal meaning of the text. No midrash, no accompanying traditions. Their motto was sola scriptura, and if you remember your high school Latin, if that still exists in uh, uh, the UK, uh, I could say that's in the ablative rather than the nominative. Sola scriptura means by scripture alone. Uh, by scripture alone, we will decide what the text means. Uh, and, uh, and by scripture alone, we will decide what the proper ideas and doctrines are that we should uh, adopt. Protestantism was thus from the very beginning devoted to a literal reading of the text and a discounting of uh, tradition. Sola scriptura meant just the words on the page. An objective understanding of the text alone would reveal its real literal meaning, and that was the only one that counted. This is a, maybe a bit of an overstatement, but I don't think it's any kind of major distortion. Of course, one problem right away that arose with Sola Scriptura was uh, that uh, you n never know whose version of the literal text to accept. Uh, what is an objective reading of scripture? Among the early Protestants were a number of wild-eyed fanatics, um, uh, some of them from this country. If scripture says an adulterer or a violator of the Sabbath is to be killed, well then, string them up. Um, all, all, and all manner of strange doctrines emerged, emerged from other enthusiasts. You may have been forced at some time in your education to read that long poem by John Dryden called Religio Laici, uh, the re religion of a layman. Uh, but he describes this beautifully. This is just a brief quote. The book was put in every, the book meaning the Bible, in every vulgar hand, which each presumed he best could understand. The spirit gave the doctoral degree, and every member of the company was of his trade and of the Bible free. So there had to be some check on individual interpretation, and that check was modern biblical scholarship. You had to study Hebrew and Greek and ancient history and everything that biblical scholars were finding out in order to know what the Bible was really saying. This led to what was perhaps the most significant development in the story I've been tracing. The old posture of both Judaism and Christianity, in which people knelt at the feet of the Bible and sought to learn from it, was now gradually being replaced by the opposite posture, in which scholars leaned over scripture and sought to learn about it, like a patient on a table, uh, etherized on a table. Uh, this is only a slight shift of prepositions, learning from being, uh, learning from being replaced by learning about but it made a world of difference in the attitude of those who sought to explain the Bible to ordinary people. Think about it. If your only guide to what the text means is the words alone, then you need to research uh, where those words came from and who they came from and when. In short, studying about the text displaced that most uh, traditional act of piety, uh, reading and learning from the scriptures, learning Torah in the Jewish case. And all this ultimately led to those questions about the historical accuracy of biblical narratives and who really wrote what and so forth. So here was and is a basic disagreement of modern biblical scholarship with Jewish tradition, a difference in attitude and approach, indeed a difference even in defining what the text of the Bible was. The reason is that one of the most basic ideas of Judaism is that the Torah is not just the words on the page. Or to put it in a more classical formulation, the Torah of Judaism consists of the written text, the Torah Shebikhtav, and the traditions that cling to nearly every verse, sometimes every word, or what is called the Torah Shebalpeh, the oral or orally transmitted Torah. The written text is not the whole story, it never was. The written text says, for example, an eye for an eye. For some reason, this is everybody's favorite uh, passage from uh, the Hebrew Bible. Actually, I remember once, <laughs> hope I'm not gonna go over my time here, but I do remember once uh, being in the Indianapolis airport and, uh, <laughs> uh, and that was the morning when there had been an unfortunate terrorist incident at the uh, Western Wall in Israel. And, I had my kippon, so this fellow just came, uh, came up and, and started telling me about this story. And, and he, said, uh, he said, well, 
what are you going to do about it? <laughs> and you know, I said I, I didn't have any personal plans to do anything. <laughs> and uh, and he said, but he wasn't really listening. He said, come on, you know, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. <laughs> And he, said, and he said, and the damnedest thing is, it seems to work over there. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> that, <laughs> that's not what I'm trying to say. It says an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but Jewish tradition in the Babylonian Talmud, and actually going all the way back to the time of Josephus, that Jewish uh, historian and writer of the first century of the Common Era, uh, they all say that uh, an eye for an eye really means mon monetary compensation for an eye. You knock out somebody's eye, he has a right to damage as he doesn't have the right to knock out uh, your eye. Um, the written text says nothing about Abraham being the first monotheist, but I'm sure some of you were taught that at some point in Sunday school. The seven basic laws given to Noah, the 39 major categories of work to be avoided on the earth, and myriad other details uh, they're really not in the written text, they're only in this uh, accompanying oral tradition. These things um, were orally transmitted uh, and had always accompanied the written text. In traditional terms, they come from the oral Torah, which was inseparable from the written one. But really, how old are these traditions? Forget for a minute Jewish doctrine. Um, how, how old can we say, you know, these ideas about, uh, about an eye for an eye? I, I, as I say, in that case, the, the oldest written attestation seems only to go back to the first century of the Common Era. Um, uh, but in general, this is a subject that I've spent a lot of time uh, looking at, and uh, I, I guess I don't want to go into it now. I may talk, to it, uh, talk about it uh, later in my last talk, but uh, actually, um, there is ample evidence of these traditions in texts going back way before the earliest writings of uh, rabbinic Judaism, starting with the Mishnah at the end of the second or early third century of the Common Era. Long, long before that, we find the same or similar traditions of interpretation in the Dead Sea Scrolls, in books like Jubilees. The Book of Jubilees is my favorite, and that goes back to 200 or so uh, before the Common Era. It knows, for example, what isn't said specifically in the biblical text that uh, Abraham underwent a series of 10 tests or that Jacob was a diligent student uh, or uh, all sorts of other things that don't really appear uh, in our Bible. In fact, there is even evidence of these accompanying traditions uh, in the later books of the Bible itself. The later books interpret earlier books, especially the Torah. So from a very early period, Jews were saying, it's not just the words on the page. All this is a long way to saying that the Protestant-inspired view of scripture as an inviolable, immutable text, separate from any tradition of interpretation, is really a product of a certain notion of scripture, one that is very different from the idea of scripture that prevailed among Jews in biblical times and long after that in rabbinic Judaism and early Christianity and on throughout the Middle Ages. What constitutes scripture, the text alone or the written and oral text, oral Torah together, is no minor disagreement between Protestant-sponsored modern biblical scholarship and traditional Judaism. You may think I have something uh, against uh, the Protestants in this presentation, but I'm really just trying to reflect on you know, what was historical fact. The, the whole movement we call modern biblical scholarship was, was quite literally sponsored uh, by Protestant churches here and in America and in Germany and Scandinavia. And if you look even today at the map, for, you know, where is modern biblical scholarship uh, produced. I hope I'm not going to be insulting too many people all at once, but they're really, uh, it may be only today that we have, you know, some good French, uh, Italian, and other uh, uh, scholars, uh, but, but for the longest time it was really a Protestant <coughs> undertaking. Um, what constitutes scripture, the text alone or the written and oral Torahs together, 
is no minor disagreement. And it seems to me that the evidence for the essential character of the so-called oral Torah, that is traditional Jewish interpretation of the Bible, is quite irrefutable. It is what the very idea of scripture of Torah was from the beginning. I guess I'd like to go into greater detail on this if there were time. Um, in brief, what I have in mind is that biblical scholars know, for example, that someone at some point gave a copy of the book of Jeremiah to some scribe. We don't know exactly where or when. It was a long time ago. And the scribe said, wow, this looks like a good book. I think I'll just add 10 chapters to it. And, uh, you know, so now we actually do have two copies of Jeremiah, uh, both represented among the Dead Sea Scrolls, one that is 10 chapters longer and has a different arrangement of the chapters. The same, as I mentioned earlier, was true of the book of Isaiah. The same with virtually every book of our Bible. At first, these books were not immutable. In the beginning, God created the malleability. Uh, and after a while, you had a choice. You know, you could change the text itself. And we see this going on all the way down through the Dead Sea Scrolls. Even at that very late date, people are changing the text. Um, uh, sticking in their own ideas or glosses, interpretations. Um, but then after a while, you had another option. You could leave the uh, text alone and change the interpretation of the text. You could say what all ancient interpreters, and please forgive me for saying this, but I've been studying them for 35 or so years, all ancient interpreters have the same refrain. The text says X, but what it really means is Y. And I have to say, being an ancient interpreter was very different from being a modern professor. Those people were respected. They, you know, <laughs> They said something and everybody believed it. So uh, that is the whole story of you know, the Jewish uh, you know, tradition of interpretation. These texts always were somewhat flexible for a while, very flexible. You know, when you think of it as a kind of narrowing funnel way at the top where you know, these, uh, this period when you could add whole chapters. As time got on, your flexibility narrowed but it didn't really narrow at all. The image I just gave you was wrong. It wasn't a narrowing funnel. Suddenly you had these authoritative interpreters and they could say, this is what the text really means despite what the words seem to be saying. Well, um, I said before that modern biblical scholarship is not simply the truth about the Bible, but the truth about a certain conception of the Bible. And it's a conception that is very different from that of Judaism's. The words on the page um, uh, equal the text's meaning. But uh, ultimately, the disagreement had something to do with the very nature of the Jewish religion. So now allow me to say something about Judaism in general. The whole idea of Judaism, uh, and I uh, agree you have to be about uh, over 60 in order to start off a sentence like that. The whole idea of Judaism is what is called in Hebrew, avodat Hashem, the service of God. Now, Judaism consists of a seemingly endless series of do's and don'ts. When you get up in the morning, you have to do X, Y, and Z. When you eat a meal, it can consists of this, but not that. You have to say these words before you start eating and some other words when you're done. You have to pray to God, not when you feel like it, but when Judaism says you have to. And the words that you say have to be the words that Judaism prescribes, and so on and so forth. The role of the written Torah in all of this is not what you might think at first. Actually, a lot of things that I just alluded to are not mentioned in the Torah at all, uh, not in the Bible. Uh, that series of blessings that you're supposed to say upon awakening, which are called in Hebrew, birchot uh, shachar, aren't in the Bible. Uh, they're not even mentioned in the Mishnah. They make their first appearance in the Babylonian Talmud. The words of the lengthy prayer that Jews are required to pray three times a day, called the Amidah or the Shmones, right, didn't come from the Torah. In fact, the Torah never required anyone to pray, though I admit Maimonides did try to argue that this was a biblical requirement. Now, the words of that prayer and, and the requirement to pray it come not from scripture, but from the writings of our rabbis. And the Torah certainly doesn't demand that you go to synagogue to say them. Uh, there were no synagogues until long after the Torah was given, 
indeed not until the end of the biblical period. Even the recitation of the Shema, morning and evening, is not, to be accurate, a requirement of the Torah so much as an interpretation of, this, of some words in the Torah, which is rather different. Please don't stop saying it and blame it on me. <laughs> the same is true of our laws of kosher food, of our way of observing the Sabbath with all its do's and don'ts, don'ts and our way of observing our festivals. In other words, all the practices and requirements that I've mentioned come from this ever-developing oral Torah. Actually, they might even be seen as a violation of the Torah, which states very clearly twice in the book of Deuteronomy that it's forbidden to add anything to what is commanded in the Torah or to take anything away from it. But that's exactly what rabbinic Judaism, the Judaism set out in the Mishnah and the Talmud and so forth, that's exactly what rabbinic Judaism endlessly does, uh, and add and take away. But how can it do so? Certainly our sages held the, the, the Torah in the highest esteem. They were the ones who insisted uh, uh, on instituting special rules about the hyper-sanctity of a Torah scroll. They were the ones who uh, created special brachot to be recited, blessings to be recited at, upon, at the public reading of the Torah. So why didn't they just insist that every word of the written text be taken literally? Uh, why not do exactly what the word said? And the answer, I think, lies in the very different conception of scripture that I've been describing. From the very beginning, the sanctity of scripture did not mean it was to be taken literally or limited to the words on the page. Indeed, the Torah's interpreters uh, often radically modified what its own words seemed to be saying. And if I had to explain why, I would go back to what I said a minute ago about the supreme goal and very essence of Judaism, namely that it is uh, avodat Hashem, the service of God. This is what the Torah teaches. In fact, the Torah is where the whole idea of avodat Hashem in this sense is first articulated. Elsewhere in the ancient Near East, serving a God entailed offering sacrifices to him or her. Only in biblical Israel does the service of God involve doing all kinds of other things, all those myriad commandments uh, that the Torah contains. But of course, the Torah is not the last word in the service of God. In a sense, it's only the first word. One might describe it as volume one in a multi-volume work called How to Serve God. You know, uh, in the publishing business, as I've learned, these how to, bu how to, how to do something uh, books are, you know, it's a whole genre and apparently one that publishers love. So this, well, this uh, is not a book, but a whole series to be called how to, serve the, uh, how to Serve God. After the Torah comes the rest of the Tanakh, and then the Mishnah and the Tosefta and the Tanaitic Midrashim, the Jerusalem and Babylonian Talmuds and so forth. These are all subsequent volumes in this same series. It's one long continuum that starts but does not end with the written Torah. The goal of all these subsequent volumes is mostly to spell out the how uh, of that service. So if, for example, the Torah forbids working on the Sabbath, the Mishnah will tell you, or at least begin to tell you, what exactly that involves, listing 39 separate categories of forbidden types of work. And then, of course, these continue to be re refined and specified right down to uh, forbidden and permitted uses of electricity on, uh, and today's Shabbat timers and microwaves and smartphones. In fact, this pinning down of all the details is, when you think about it, a Jewish obsession. Uh, why is it so important to spell these out? And I think it all goes back to that same principle of avodat Hashem. Uh, the whole idea is to serve God as fully as possible, and the more details, the more precisely Judaism is deemed uh, uh, to be carrying out God's will, to be serving God. I do want to talk um, more about this in um, the talk that I intend to give tomorrow, which is somewhat different from what's listed in your program, so you could mentally correct it. The talk uh, the, that I'm going to give is entitled... Uh, uh, the man who mistook his tefillin for a hat. Uh, so uh, please don't miss it. <laughs>
uh, if sometimes something in the literal words of the Torah do not seem to be cons consonant with the goal of avodat Hashem, the service of God, or to fit with rabbinic theology or something similarly basic, rabbinic interpreters did not hesitate to deviate from the evident sense of the Torah's own words. An eye for an eye means not an eye for an eye, and so forth. So rabbinic Judaism is the opposite of literalistic, and its conception of the Bible is not limited to the words on the page. For the same reason, as you may have noticed, the stories of Genesis are turned from little histories to stories with a message, stories that tell you how to behave. So Abraham became what he is actually never said to be in the Bible, the first monotheist. And Jacob became Yaakov HaTzadik, Jacob the righteous, although his treatment of his brother Esau, his lying to his own father, and his walking off with most of his uncle's wealth all seem to suggest something different. Um, while that same Esau is converted into Esau the wicked, although again, his story in Genesis hardly suggests that. But it was important that even these stories had to be turned to the same purpose of avodat Hashem, so that our ancestors had to be models of probity and their opponents into the very opposite. I'm getting to the end, but I wanted to finally come to the matter um, which, um, about which there is much confusion, and that is what modern biblical scholarship has to say about the divine origin of the Torah. Most people, especially many Jews, uh, seem to think that the inevitable result of modern biblical scholarship is the demonstration that the Torah did not come from God. Actually, the divine origin of the Torah is the one thing that modern biblical scholarship has nothing to say about. And I have never encountered any work of modern biblical scholarship, not one, that says this verse or this story or this law did not come from God. I've never seen anything like that, and the reason is simple. The Torah consists of words. Now, words all look the same. There are no special markings that identify this word as having come from God and that one as being of merely human origin. Words are words are words. So how is a modern scholar or anyone else to discover that this or that word or the whole text does or does not come from God? Scholars certainly may talk reasonably, even enlighteningly, about other things, such as the historical context in which a, a given passage was written, or its relationship to the writings of ancient Israel's neighbors. There may even, um, they may even question the traditional attributions of various books to the authorship of Moses or David, whoever. Uh, but uh, none of this addresses in the slightest the crucial matter of the transmission of God's words to us. There is no titration that can be performed on it, no litmus paper that can be dipped in between its sentences in order to verify or disprove this hypothesis. Words are words. As for the particular circumstances in which those words were uttered, again, these things in no way affect the matter of the belief in the Torah's divine origin. But then, given everything I've said, why not simply say that volume one is no different from volume two? Forget about divine origin entirely. It can't be proven in any case. So here let me say, again, asking your, whole, your permission to hold forth about the very idea of Judaism, uh, let me say that the divine origin of the Torah is absolutely essential to anything that calls itself Judaism. I, at least, could never be part of any version of Judaism that denies this. Now, certainly one of the most basic tenets of Judaism is that God speaks to human beings, that God is involved with human beings and human affairs. From the beginning, Judaism had prophets who acted as God's intermediaries, spokesmen to whom God spoke directly. And they said things like, thus says the Lord, or the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, so a strictly man-made Torah is inconceivable in Judaism. But at the same time, I know something else that is equally basic to Judaism, and that is that precisely because God speaks to humans, what ultimately, what starts off in heaven, the divinely given part of Judaism, must ultimately be handed off to human beings. This uh, is true of the multi-volume work I have mentioned, How to Serve God, 
even the staunchest exponent of the divine origin of everything Jewish, at some point, somewhere has to draw a line. Uh, even if someone were to claim, and of course I've heard this claimed, um, that every word of Jewish tradition, not only the Mishnah and the Tosefta and Midrash, but all the Shakla Vitarya, the give and take of the Babylonian sages of the Talmud, even if someone were to claim that every word of all this was divinely given or divinely inspired, such a person would eventually have to admit that the div divine word is given over to human interpreters, human codifiers, human poskim. The classical rabbis were hardly ashamed of this passage from the divine to human authorities. It was, on the contrary, a point of great pride. Um, I'm running out of time, so I'll leave my examples at this point. Actually, I'll get to them, I hope, in the next couple of days. Uh, I, in general, I guess I'd say uh, modern biblical scholarship cannot be dismissed with a sweep of the hand. That hasn't been my intention, and frankly, uh, it's not going to happen no matter what I want. Uh, uh, for reasons already explained, much of what it has to say uh, can be disturbing uh, to a certain sort of traditional belief. At the same time, one must consider the very conception of scripture that underlies modern biblical scholarship, a literalist conception that is at odds with the traditional Jewish idea of Torah, an idea with clear roots going way back into the biblical period itself. In this old Jewish conception, the written text is really not the sole weight-bearing column in the structure of Judaism. It is quite inseparable from the oral traditions that have so willfully interpreted the written text. In fact, as I'm reading this, I'm, I, I may not be saying this you know, clearly enough. Um, uh, the uh, uh, desire one finds elsewhere to reinterpret the Bible, now we have this fact, now we have that, is quite irrelevant to Judaism because its postulate is really that the Torah has been interpreted definitively once and for all in the great classic works of uh, rabbinic Judaism, the Mishnah, the Tosefta, and the other books that I've mentioned. So what does the Torah means, mean? It means what our rabbis long ago um, said that it means. And uh, uh, I think, um, I mean, I've heard some people say, and I, I, don't get me wrong, I don't agree with this, but some people have described Judaism as the religion of the rabbis uh, masquerading as the religion of Moses. Uh, that, it seems to me, is a, uh, an overstatement. Uh, but it is true that ultimately, the religion uh, that we call Judaism is a product uh, of those rabbis and their definitive interpretation of the text. It is this rewritten text that is our real uh, scripture. So the idea, uh, the Jewish idea of scripture is altogether different from the one underlying modern biblical scholarship. The words of the text alone are not everything. The ultimate reason standing behind this Jewish notion is its devotion to avodat Hashem, the service of God. So sometimes the text has to be tinkered with or added to in order to make it more fully serve the purpose of avodat Hashem. This is the one thing that Jews hold even higher than the Torah itself. That's how come they could tinker with the text. However dear the Torah is to Jews, in the end, we do not worship the Torah, we worship God. Of course, Judaism insists that the Torah is of divine origin. As I said, it would be scarcely possible to think otherwise. Yet while insisting on the centrality of this tenet, I would also say that it is undeniable in the Jewish scheme of things that what starts in heaven ultimately ends up in the hands of human sages, human interpreters, human decisors, poskim. Uh, that also is built into the system. Viewed from this standpoint, modern scholarship, um, I have to tell you frankly, it's interesting. I've uh, really loved studying it and teaching it all these years, but because of its very different underlying assumptions, it really is quite irrelevant to the practice of Judaism and this notion, this central notion of avodah Tashem. I don't think I'm schizophrenic, uh, but I have no trouble living with both of them. I see modern scholarship and Judaism as existing on two different planes, uh, 
that simply do not intersect. As I said, um, I wouldn't ever force anyone to study modern biblical scholarship, but I think that anyone who truly understands what I've been saying today will not be troubled by it. Indeed, he or she might even get into the same racket as I did. Um, teaching everything scholars have learned about biblical texts and the historical circumstances in which they first appeared uh, is a fascinating pursuit, uh, but it's altogether different from the study of Torah. Uh, this talk has been, as I said, a kind of preview of the next uh, three lectures at Limud tomorrow's, which starts at 420, is, as I mentioned, the man who mistook his tefillin for a hat. I hope to see you then. Thank you very much. I think uh, we have about, you know, five or ten minutes for questions, so, uh, you know, as my wife once said uh, about me, he's been dodging questions most of his life, so there should be no challenge. Yes? I'd like to have your view on the Kulach Nefesh. On? The Kulach Nefesh. Yes. Completely post-biblical. Yes. And it's fundamental now. Right, actually, that was, that's a good example. There is this uh, concept in rabbinic Judaism Can you called... The yes, I, I'm, I'm getting there. Um, <laughs> it, uh, it, it, the concept is called pikuach nefesh, that you're allowed to violate uh, all sorts of uh, biblical commandments in order to save uh, a life. And it's, it's a good question because uh, in, in support of this doctrine, they did, you know, cite a verse from the Torah that describes the... Uh, uh, the Torah is uh, something that you shatahai by him. You live by these laws, live and don't die. So if uh, a uh, law, with some exceptions, uh, uh, threatens human life, it's permitted to, um, uh, to save the uh, human being and violate the law. That's not a bad example of uh, what I've been talking about. Thank you. Yes. So you, you talked about Torah Misinai and you said that you can't be in a religion without but then it comes to human beings and we do something with it. Um, the, the question of Torah me Sinai is a dividing point between Orthodox and non-Orthodox Jews. And I wonder if you could expand on that a little bit because you went by that a little fast. Right, okay, I'm happy to uh, say it again. I, uh, or actually, I may not have said it clearly. Um, the, uh, what I was trying to say is there are two different doctrines. There's one uh, that says Torah mi Sinai, that the Torah was given to Moses on Mount Sinai, and the other is Torah mi uh, Shemaim, of course, means heaven, but, uh, but it, in rabbinic parlance, it's used as a, a, a kind of circumlocution for God, that the Torah comes from God. That's uh, Torah mi uh, And uh, I, I think it is important, um, uh, though scoundrels have done this as well, I think it's important to distinguish between those two ideas. And I would say, trying to be fair, that, um, that the, uh, the, the former uh, Torah mi Sinai is really not um, uh, a uh, weight-bearing member of uh, Jewish tradition, but Torah mi Nashamayim certainly is. Uh, I, I tried to say a few times, you, can't, you really can't have any Judaism without uh, a divinely given Torah. But the particular historical circumstances in which this happens, historical and I would add geographical circumstances, um, that wasn't nearly as important to our rabbis. In fact, they say at one point that um, anyone who suggests that Moses, being Moses, made up this word, this verse, uh, and, and that it didn't come from God, it was just his own invention, uh, uh, that person is a blasphemer and is to be duly punished. Uh, 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 the idea of Torah mi uh is, uh, is absolute. I don't, think, uh, uh, I don't think anyone can uh, disagree with that. I, I have to say, um, I've talked to, you know, I, I speak a lot of places and I, I've, I've spoken with people who don't really seem to, describe, uh, seem to subscribe to the, the doctrine of Torah Minashamayim. And I remember once um, I was at a, a 
congregation in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. And, uh, uh, you know, I ate at the, it was a conservative synagogue, and I ate at the rabbi's house, and I hope I'm not misrepresenting what he said, but basically I remember the conversation pretty clearly, and he said that what the Torah really was was a, a, um, a human response to the ineffable. And, uh, and I, I, at one point I said, and I, I think this is a good summary of, of the two positions, I said, I don't know whose idea of God uh, is more incredible. I, I, you, you know, I believe in a God that can speak to human beings, and you believe in a God who can't speak to human beings. And there's really no reason to say you know, the, the one idea is uh, more reasonable uh, than, uh, than the other. So um, while I am in favor of, I, I, I think it's a reasonable understanding of a great many Jewish texts, and frankly, I'm far from the first person to point all this stuff out, and you know, it's been written about by um, older and better than me. But uh, but that this this disjunction of those two ideas is crucial, and it's important to say that to the rabbis, uh, Moses, Mount Sinai, uh, that wasn't a crucial weight-bearing uh, uh, idea. Uh, in Judaism, I think the greatest demonstration of the fact of that fact is that we actually have no idea where Mount Sinai is. I mean, if it was so crucial, wouldn't there be a tradition saying it's that mountain next to Santa Catarina in the Sinai? But actually, um, there's no evidence that uh, you know that's just a much later guess about the locale of, of uh, Mount Sinai and. Uh, it seems actually, to, according to modern scholars, to be uh, uh, probably way off. It seems like Sinai was probably uh, far to the east of that site. But we don't really know. We have no, uh, no actual tradition of, of uh, where Mount Sinai was. And um, even the date of uh, the giving of the Torah, the one that's preserved in Judaism is, uh, you know, again, uh, the product of a lot of biblical interpretation, but uh, um, may not, you know, all we know is that uh, from the Torah is that it was given in the third month of the year. So that may be a, a roundabout answer, but I do think that, uh, uh, that uh, our rabbis from the very beginning did distinguish between those two ideas, and the one that really counted was the divine origin. Yes? Well, uh, you know, to begin with, uh, I, I mean, I suppose the short answer is what I said before. Our Torah is uh, the Torah of our rabbis. Uh, it's not open to, you know, new interpretation. And if you say that isn't historically accurate, I suppose, uh, you know, a proper answer would be, so what? The, uh, the Torah is this text as it was interpreted by our rabbis. And uh, you don't need to go, um, you know, into earlier stages of the Torah, how it came to be and so forth. The minute, I would say this, the minute that you start to accept those as the terms of uh, disagreement, you lose. Uh, I mean, I do believe in modern biblical scholarship. I do think the things that uh, scholars have discovered over the last uh, 120, 150 years are, you know, pretty uh, basically correct. There's still plenty of disagreement. Uh, in, in fact, even about the uh, documentary hypothesis that, uh, that I mentioned. Uh, but I don't know of, um, of modern scholars who, you know, kind of uh, assert, uh, and by modern scholars, I mean these sort of decadent university types who, you know, at Oxford and a place like that. But, uh, but I don't think that, uh, that there's anyone who rejects that in favor of the unitary authorship uh, of Moses. But it's quite irrelevant to what I was saying. Uh, I, I can see that this is a, you know, it's a hard point for people to grasp. Uh, the, the Torah that we have is the Torah of our rabbis. Uh, it, it's as much the, uh, you know, what it, that is as true uh, of what it says about Moses as it is true of what it says about an eye for an eye. Yes. <coughs> 
Right. Yeah, I just, I, 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 frankly, it seems, um, you know, intellectually dishonest. Uh, I guess the best I could say about people who say that is they may just know nothing at all about modern scholarship or, or, or one or two things that they don't like. Uh, but, uh, but modern scholarship, you know, as I say, it's been this, you know, ongoing enterprise. So, you know, it's in certainly its second, really its third century. Yeah. Ah, well, I know there are people, you know, who do that. And so I end up, I mean, to uh, some of my critics' surprise, being a kind of right winger on this. But uh, I, I, don't think, I, I don't think there's any possible compromise between um, modern biblical scholarship and traditional Jewish belief, to evoke the items of today's uh, title. I, I'm actually scheduled to uh, um, do a session um, uh, with Norman Solomon uh, towards the end of this week, and, and uh, I, I, I have no idea. It could turn out to be pretty awful. Uh, but, but, uh, but, but I think I, I'm a, on this particular question, I'm, I'm a, uh, you know, a, a little less liberal than, uh, than he is, or than certainly uh, uh, some people are. I really. Uh, I, I really think that there's, you know, these two enterprises are completely different and therefore utterly uh, incompatible. Yes? So, do you think that the rabbis of your, what they wrote and how they interpreted the Torah is definitive? Does that mean we stop writing volumes of how to serve God? Well, what a good question. Thank you. Uh, the question was, you know, if indeed our rabbis were sort of definitive, um, let me change your question a little bit. Uh, does, that, does that mean that there's really no more speculating about what the Torah means? We've, you know, all, already got it all down. And I guess in some sense I, I agree with that. Um, but uh, uh, let me say, you could be asking, for example, as some people have, you know, uh, why does Kugel not say anything about, uh, you know, all those great medieval uh, biblical interpreters who come after our rabbis? And I certainly, you know, uh, you know, I'm quite fond of them. I actually try to make a practice of still reading, you know, Ramban and Ibn Ezra and so forth on Shabbat. Um, but um, I do know that they are, uh, they are operating under a different set of assumptions. They're really out to find, find out what the words of this text mean. So in my world of Judaism, I know where that leads. The, ultimately, that leads to modern biblical scholarship. They didn't know that. Uh, uh, I, I admire the way uh, Ibn Ezra can say, you know, there are a certain number of verses uh, that imply that, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, they weren't written by Moses. And then he, you know, it's really like, you know, a, a, an amazing immune system. He just sort of isolates them like cancerous cells and, you know, you know says, but everything else is fine. It really took, an, you know, a few more centuries until uh, we got to Spinoza who said, oh no, these are not little isolated examples. These are symptoms of, uh, of how the whole Torah came to be written. It's not what we were told. I think in, in general, that is the end of the road for anybody who pursues uh, you know, the line of inquiry that uh, really started with our medieval uh, parshanim, our medieval interpreters of scripture, which is why I'm a sort of, uh, you know, chazal, rabbinic interpretation fundamentalist. Yeah. I also, I mean, I, 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 I guess this is the last thing I'll say, and give you guys a chance to have something to eat, and myself too. Uh, but I, I, uh, I always, I, I, I never really even liked the idea of printing up um, the text of the Torah with Rashi's commentary. Not because Rashi was so much in pursuit of the literal meaning of the text. He really wanted just to make a kind of anthology of um, rabbinic midrash. But in doing so, I think he kind of lost some of the spirit of rabbinic midrash, which is so... Uh, wonderfully creative and also um, non-doctrinaire. Uh, 
you know, it could mean this, and then davar acher, it could mean that. Uh, my ideal would be to print up uh, the text of the Torah with uh, Yalkut Shimoni, which is a late medieval anthology of midrashic comments, and then you get to pick and choose. And, and, uh, and of course, they're very clear about matters of halakha, but other things were very much up in the air. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Hope to see you tomorrow.